In the last part, we learned how the Unicode Consortium came together and came up with encodings like UTF-32 and UTF-16 and the problems associated with them. By now, it was clear that the ASCII world will not accept any encoding in which the data size would increase. So any encoding that Unicode came up with had to be compatible with ASCII. That is, if a file contained ASCII text and it was interpreted and read using the ASCII encoding, the file should also be read correctly when interpreted using the Unicode encoding. And thus was designed the UTF-8 encoding scheme. So if it had to understand the ASCII text in the same way as if it was UTF-8, it means that UTF-8 should be an 8-bit character set so that there is no difference between the standard ASCII and UTF-8. But then one cannot map all the characters in the world because a byte is too small as we already know. By the way, I am using this box without the blue background color to represent a byte, which is 8 bits, and the box with a blue background color will represent a bit for this tutorial. So this first box is a byte, all right? So because 8 bits is too small, UTF-8 had to be a multi-byte character set, just like UTF-16. So contrary to what many think, UTF-8 is not just a fixed 8-bit character set, okay? It is a multi-byte character set in which a character can be represented either in 8 bits or a byte, or 16 bits or 2 bytes, or 24 bits or 3 bytes, or 32 bits which is 4 bytes. So it is named UTF-8 because characters can be represented in multiples of 8 bits. Now if we are given a sequence of bytes which represent some characters in UTF-8 and we are asked to parse or read those characters, we will start from the beginning. That is the first byte. But how many bytes should I read before I can figure the first character? Because after all UTF-8 is multi-byte. So the first character might have been encoded in one byte or two bytes or three bytes or four bytes, who knows. So it means that our definition of UTF-8 is still incomplete. We need to define few more things before we can interpret the data. So to find how many bytes is a character encoded in, we use some kind of markers, okay? So if the first bit of a byte is set to zero, we consider that a character is encoded in one byte. And this case is meant for the backward compatibility with ASCII, isn't it? Because all standard ASCII code points range from 0 to 127, which will have most significant bits set to 0. Code points larger than 127 are represented by multi-byte sequences. So if a byte starts with 1, 1 and 0, it means that the character is encoded in 2 bytes. Because there are two ones, you know, if you want to understand it that way. So one more byte must be read before trying to interpret the character. The first byte is called the leading byte, which tells us how many bytes would be required to be read. And the second byte is called the continuation byte and is marked with a 1, 0 in the higher order position of this byte, all right? If a character is encoded in three bytes, then the leading byte must contain three ones followed by a zero in the high order position. And because this character contains three bytes, hence two more continuation bytes must follow. By the way, the crosses here contain the actual code point data, as we will see later. Then if four bytes are used for representing a character, the leading byte starts with four ones followed by a zero then three continuation bytes follow. By the way, why do we need to mark the continuation bytes? That is, you know, we have marked them starting as one followed by a zero. Why couldn't we just read from the leading byte, you know, how many bytes are to be read before extracting the code point value? Well, because the computers are all over the world, you know, the encoding is also designed for things like streaming data, etc. For example, if you wanted to read some stock exchange data which started streaming at probably, you know, 10 a.m. in the morning and you log in at, say, 11 a.m., you know, the first byte that you encounter may be a continuation byte, which you must discard, you know, because you can only start reading when you encounter a leading byte the first time. 
So there should be a way to identify if a byte is a continuation byte. Another point to note is that UTF-8 can be extended to 6 bytes if required. But even with 4 bytes, a huge amount of space is left and nearly all the characters are already mapped. So there does not seem to be a need to extend it to you know, 6 bytes, but it can be done in case we meet the aliens. Now we will look at how to encode and decode code points, that is the integer numbers in UTF-8. But before that, let's have a little quiz. The first question is this, out of these given bit sequences, you need to identify the one which may represent a valid character in UTF-8. The first option has zero in the high order bit, so it has to be a single byte character. So this is a valid option. What about option B? Well, here the byte starts with a 110, so it must be a multi-byte representation and this must be the leading byte. And two ones tell us that there must be two bytes, but here we only have one byte, so this cannot be correct. In case of option C, the sequence starts with three ones and a zero. So there must be three bytes in this character with this leading byte and two continuation bytes. And we can see that there are two continuation bytes starting with a one and a zero, which is the marker for a continuation byte. Then for option four, there must be two bytes, you know, because the sequence starts with two ones and a zero. But there must be a continuation byte, which we see here. But the continuation byte is not valid, you know, because it does not start with a marker meant for the continuation byte, which is a one and a zero. So option D is also not correct. The second question is this. What would be the pattern of the bytes in case six bytes were used? It is quite simple. The marker, if we follow the pattern that we saw, should be six ones followed by a zero and then five more continuation bytes starting with a one and zero. Okay. And I have laid out the bytes like this, although the memory is linear, something like this. Okay. So the leading byte corresponds to this byte, but I had to lay it out like this because of lack of space. Now, what about the second part of the problem? Well, let's try to see what would the leading byte look in case of seven bytes. It will look like this, right? Seven ones followed by a zero. But this number is 254 or FE in hex, which is a part of the non-character sequence defined by Unicode, like what we saw in the byte order mark, you know, when we were dealing with UTF-16. So we cannot have this bit sequence in a character mapping unless Unicode allows it. I just put it across, although you know this is a little too much of detail and you may even choose to ignore it if you want. So now let's look at how to encode a code point integer into a UTF-8 binary string or decode a given UTF-8 binary data into the code point integer which is what is mapped to a character. We will start with the decoding process first. That is, given the UTF-8 encoded binary data, we will retrieve the code point value from it. If the byte started with a zero in the high order bit, it's just like reading ASCII, you know, a regular binary to decimal conversion. So the code point here is 65, which represents the character A in the English language. That's why UTF-8 is fully backward compatible with ASCII. That is, even if you pass a standard ASCII text to a UTF-8 parser, it will interpret everything correctly because there is no difference between the ASCII representation and UTF-8 representation up to a code point of 127. But the fun starts here when we have multibytes. As I said earlier, the marker bits, which I have shown as green color, do not represent data or the code point. Basically, they don't have anything to do with the code point, okay? So we take this non-marker part from the leading byte, write down those bits, and then append the bits from the continuation bytes in the same order, that is from left to right. So this is the binary code point, and the decimal code point can be found by a regular binary to decimal conversion. So that means there must be a maximum value of the code point after which one more byte needs to be added. 
and that is shown in this table. So in case of one byte, the minimum value of code point is of course zero and the maximum value is 127 containing all the basic ASCII characters. For code points 128 to 2047, we use two bytes to represent a character. Then for code points 2048 to 65535, we use three bytes to represent a character and so on. So let's try to encode a code point say 927 into a UTF-8 binary sequence. So the first thing that needs to be figured is how many bytes will be required, okay? And that's the first thing in the algorithm if you are encoding. So to find that we need to see where the number 927 lies. Well, it is more than 127 and less than 2047. Hence, we have to use two bytes to represent it. So we start with the decimal code point 927 and convert it to a binary sequence, which is the binary code point. Then we lay out two bytes with their usual markers. Now, using the binary code point, we have to fill up the blue colored bits and our job is done. So we will start from the rightmost continuation byte, okay? Here, there are only two bytes. So we will start with the second byte. If there were three bytes in use, we would have started from the third byte, all right? Now, all continuation bytes have six places. So when we start from a continuation byte, we will pick these six binary digits from the right and place them here. If we were using three bytes, we would have selected the next six bytes to place in the second byte. But because we only have two bytes here, we will take the remaining digits and place them in the leading byte. What happens to the unfilled bits in the leading byte? Well, they become zero. So the code point 927 in UTF-8 binary sequence will look like this. If you are a web developer and have written or seen HTML, you may have noticed that we put the character set information in the meta tag. This helps in telling the browser that the server is going to send you data in this particular encoding so that it can use that encoding to interpret and display the proper data. If the text you send is all ASCII and the char set hint is UTF-8, the browser will be able to display the data properly. But if you have data, say, in an Indian language or Japanese or Chinese, it should be in UTF-8 format. And if the char set is set to, say, ISO something for Latin characters, then the browser will not be able to interpret the data correctly. For example, it may not even find evaluated code points in the Latin character set and may show as question marks all over the place. And sometimes, even though it is able to find the right code points when your char set and the encoding used in the data is the same, you may see diamonds or squares, you know, sometimes even with some numbers on them. Well, that happens usually because, you know, on the client side, the browser does not find any glyph in the fonts to be able to paint the data. Now that we understand at some basic level how characters are represented in a computer, the same ideas can be extended to represent colors, sounds, well, anything that can be given an integer representation. So as long as you can represent something mathematically as integers, there would be a way to have it in computers. For example, you may have seen a color palette in a paint program where a color is represented using some RGB values, R for red, G for green, and B for blue. And each of these usually varies from zero to 255, which can be stored in a byte. So we may need three bytes to represent the color at some, let's say a pixel. And we can say that a picture is nothing but a two dimensional array of pixels, each pixel having some RGB value. And then the graphics program can read this array and paint the picture on the screen. And this was rather a simplistic way of representing pictures and there would be other different ways to be able to store color information uh, for pixel. And that's why you see so many different image types like, you know, JPEG and PNG and GIF and so on. And each of these will have some pros and cons in the way they store data for each pixel and interpret it. But there are still many things which we don't know how to represent mathematically. For example, you know, can we give a numeric value to smell or taste? Now, there is something about characters and fonts 
that is how a character is actually drawn or displayed on your screen and that we'll talk about in a supplementary video later thanks for watching